Welcome to this presentation on open source modeling platforms. My name is John Hedengren. My co-author is Bethany Nicholson from Sandia. We're going to give a perspective on some of the current trends in scientific computing and how to judge open source momentum. So different packages have momentum and what are some of the metrics that we can use to judge that. I'll talk about algebraic modeling languages and then also data-driven modeling languages. We'll talk about the speed of innovation and why open source is important and why community driven projects ultimately lead to these successful platforms that can be deployed on large scale, very complex and uh, innovative applications. We'll also talk about the future of open source tools, what's coming next and also what's needed in these platforms and in these communities. So let's just talk about current trends in programming, first of all. Now, you can see a number of languages from the early 1980s. Fortran was the most popular. Uh, C then became the most popular, C++. And you could see at a certain point, different things change in terms of object-oriented programming, where you also see a lot of web development happening, um, you know, with the dot-com era. And so you see a lot of programming languages, server side, uh, client side programming languages. And you see Python emerge here and you can see Python moving up. OK, this list. And there you can see by 2019, Python is at the top uh, with some of the other popular ones such as JavaScript, Java, C Sharp. But in terms of scientific, OK, scientific programming languages, we see Python really emerging from some of these others. So you see uh, C++ and uh, you know also Fortran was much earlier. It had its decline, it was replaced by others. And then you see the emergence of Python. Okay, so Python has become very popular, not only for other things like web programming and um, you know, many other applications, but also in scientific computing as well. All right, so let's talk about open source momentum. As you're looking at different packages, one of the most critical things that you wanna do as a member of an organization is think about what's gonna be around long-term. And especially the momentum that it requires to switch platforms, it's quite high in terms of cost, retraining people, um, even installing, maintaining some of these packages. So we wanted to think carefully about that. And so one of the, some of the metrics that we've proposed um, are things like the install rate, uh, Q&A forum posts, the number of citations. So are, is academia working with this software as well? And that's from the user side. Now, as we look at the developer side as well, you want to look at you know when was the most recent release? Uh, how does the documentation look? Is it easy to pick up and start using? It can also handle the complexity that you need. All right, OS support is it supported by all the all of the major platforms? And then there's also GitHub insights about you know things like uh, number of commits, um, you know the activity of the community that is supporting this package. And so we see momentum in things like machine learning publications or artificial neural networks and MPC publications. These have really taken off in the last few years. Um, and we see, you know, even MPC is uh, starting to uh, really grow here as well. Okay, so um, let's look at some of the common algebraic modeling languages. And this is on a log scale in terms of the monthly downloads. And so you can see three that we've highlighted here. We weren't able to get monthly results. We got current ones from Jump, uh, but not monthly ones. Um, so we have Pyomo, all right, and Kasadi and Gecko that we've compared in these three. So you can see from 2017, 2018, this was you know, the last CPC FOCAPO meeting and just within five years how much that's changed in terms of the number of you know uh, the adoption now this is that from the PyPy index and how many downloads so some of those are bots just uh, mirroring these but you gives you a general idea about how much these are used and how much they're deployed in practice so let's just talk about Pyomo that was at the top of the list it's 
uh, Python-based open source package. It supports a variety of problems, including linear programming, quadratic, nonlinear programming, mixed integer linear programming, mixed integer quadratic, mixed integer nonlinear, stochastic, generalized disjunctive programming. You know, so many other areas uh, that are supported with this environment. And one of the things that's impressive about this is it's also being used for the DEA's integration platform where multiple of these things like rigorous model sensitivity, you know, down here, you've got data management frameworks, um, you have Pyomo that's integrated in here to the advanced equation oriented solvers, you have, uh, you know, process dynamics. So this is becoming an integrated platform where some of these open source tools are, are put together in a way that makes this very usable full featured package and, um, and it's it's also supported by several of the national labs and others so it's not going away anytime soon it's a it's a common platform that's being developed for some of these types of uh, modeling okay now you look at the software ecosystem and uh, you know it's using power systems and we have process systems water systems sensor placement and monitoring and then these are some of the numerical methods all right and, as, and also some of the math programming and then third-party solvers that are integrated with this so very full featured uh, many different verticals in terms of applications and uh, you can see that uh, you know the complexity that you can solve with these types of problems is increasing so let's just talk about some of the benchmark cases because it's important as you develop new software packages that you test these on standard benchmark problems. So this might be, for example, energy storage, uh, which is very important in terms of uh, utilizing renewable energy. Uh, some of the modern power systems with solar and wind that are not dispatchable and, and how do you incorporate that with energy storage? So simple mathematical um, optimization problems such as this test this new platform okay so if you're developing a new platform you want to test it against benchmark problems and there are many good benchmark sets uh, such as cuter cops others in optimization but we need some that are more realistic in terms of the types of engineering problems that we're developing. So this is just an example of a publication that discusses some energy benchmarks, for example. All right, and here's another one with code generation where you have two things that you're producing. Um, you know, this might be heat and power, for example, and you need to be able to balance demand for both of those and be able to ramp up and down as needed. All right, there's also benchmarks that we can use, uh, such as hardware benchmarks. And this is a common one. Uh, we've distributed about 10,000 of these now, these little Arduino-based temperature control labs. And they're starting to show up in more and more publications as benchmarks of new methods. So as somebody develops a new method in automation or control, and even in optimization and machine learning, these little devices are one of the standard benchmarks that are used uh, commonly. All right, so just to highlight some of the other applications that can be completed with some of these open source tools. Uh, this is a flight optimization problem where we collaborated with Facebook on some of these high altitude, long endurance aircraft uh, flying wings. They would fly at 60,000 feet, harvest solar energy during the day, and um, the challenge was we wanted to be able to fly this at 42 degrees latitude north during winter solstice okay so be able to make it through the full 24 hours um, be able to harvest as much sunlight as possible and fly efficiently so that you could stay afloat during that time of year at that latitude and when we first started it uh, was about 17 hours just using a circular five kilometer radius orbit for the station keeping and through optimization it, it did something interesting now you can see that down here in the uh, lower left where it started to fly these different types of formations 
and then also ra rise in altitude. So that was its energy storage. It would go from 60,000 feet elevation up to about 75,000 feet, and that it was able to store some of the potential energy uh, once the battery was full. Um, so it did some non-intuitive things that we didn't expect, and it was able to get to 24 hours uh, at winter solstice. All right, there's also applications in drilling automation. Now, this did something surprising. When we gave it a large gas influx, we needed to see what the automation would do, and it did something non-intuitive. It started uh, rotating the drill string faster when it had a big gas influx. And we thought, okay, that's not quite right. Why did it do that? We took it to some of the operators who were experienced. They said, actually, there's a long string and immediate effect on increasing the friction factor of the fluid returning through the annulus. Uh, so it was able to discover something that was non-intuitive in terms of being able to control the well. So there are some very complex uh, multi-physics types of problems that have been addressed with this equation-oriented approach. But I want to talk a little bit also about data-driven modeling languages and some of the impact that we've seen from those. And uh, so we have three common packages here, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and sklearn. And you can see from 2017, we've had a similar major increase in terms of the monthly downloads. Now, the other ones that we mentioned, uh, you know, Pyomo and others, they were on, uh, you know, they were much less than these. So this data-driven approach uh, has perhaps achieved a broader uh, impact in terms of uh, usability users that are that are uh, using this in terms in other industries. Um, so there's a bit of discrepancy there between the data-driven and more the equation-oriented or physics-based modeling that is taking place. And we're going to talk about how some of those are being combined in this next generation of tools. So data-driven applications have seen uh, many applications in terms of self-driving cars. You can see a, a self-driving Tesla here. Uh, you see applications of machine learning on your cell phone, on uh, web applications. We're going to start seeing that in product delivery, in terms of transportation, medical industry, and many other areas. As we start having this, taking this data that's being generated from all of these different areas and be able to turn that into actionable and useful information. So that's what data-driven applications do. They take data and turn it into actionable or useful information. All right, now we, we talk also about combining architectures. Now, one of the things that we, I mentioned is that, uh, you know, we have this, we have empirical, all right, and we have more of the physics-based modeling approaches. And we see that in the typical hierarchy for controlling chemical plants, refineries, and others, where you might have a rigorous steady state model. Okay, that's might be based on physics. Uh, you might also have a steady state linear model. And that might be based on economics, for example. And then you might have a dynamic linear empirical, and then maybe a deterministic control policy. And one of the, the characteristics of these are that, you know, we typically solve this over weeks or months, hours, minutes, or seconds. And as we discussed in the last Vocapo CPC meeting, there's more integration that's happening between these layers in terms of sharing information or even combining these types of applications. Now, one of the interesting things that's, that we need from this is that you can see we also need to be able to combine models if we're going to do this and fully integrate these. So we see steady state linear, maybe the top one is economics. The second one is a physics-based model. The third one might be just some type of a time series model identification. And then, uh, you know, heuristics, rule-based uh, systems. So we need tools that are going to be able to combine these into a single architecture and be able to work seamlessly with physics-based or empirical models. So how do we do that? Uh, we see physics-based simulators, you know, and I'm going to 
say that's our physics base. It comes from knowledge of a person who is able to write equations. And you see that might be able to provide you know, simulations that then can be trained by a machine learning algorithm. You could have it also go the other way, where we can take data from a process and update the parameters of the physics-based simulator. We can go another step, and we can take our physics-based simulators and our data and then subtract those and take a residual and fit that with machine learning. But what can we do to combine these into a single architecture where it isn't either physics-based or empirical methods, but where we can combine those into a single architecture? So let's talk about the speed of innovation and how that's affecting things. So here's give an example, optimization example in Python using Gecko. And you can see chat GPT is able to provide an example. And then I wanted to take it one step further. Now solve the problem with Pyomo. Okay, so it says certainly here's an example of how to solve the same problem using Pyomo. You can see that it did a fairly good job. There are a couple of minor mistakes, but it's uh, this large language model was able to learn optim these optimization platforms. It was able to do that because of what's posted. Okay, so here's Kasadi, for example. Uh, the documentation that's posted, the question and answers. So if you go to Stack Overflow or these other platforms, this is how these large language models are being trained. So you can say, see how to program the same thing with Jump in Julia, for example. So all of these, it's very important with these open source platforms that the documentation, the user community, everything is online. So not only can people learn, but now next generation of uh, these large language models can also be trained and learn how to solve these types of problems. Now you can see here, it was able to learn from all of these platforms that have ample uh, communities and activity online. So speed of innovation, things are changing. We're gonna more and more be in a place where there's gonna be auto ML. Um, we're gonna have uh, other types of tool, their tools are going to automate a lot of this for us. And so we're going to be the architects. We're going to be the quality control. We're going to be the ones that give the overview, the architecture, uh, and then let the tools be able to work out the details for us. So more and more, the speed of innovation is going to allow us to focus on higher levels of abstraction. Now, as we talk about the future of open source tools, you know, what's next? You have uh, companies such as Google putting their uh, development efforts behind platforms like Jax, uh, which are gonna be significant players in the future. You see different types of model architectures like transformers that were formerly applied to natural language processing, uh, being applied in other ways for time series predictions that are used for model predictive control. We're also gonna see further integration of these application layers and tightening the coupling between those to be able to exploit some of the benefits that come by merging these architectures. We're also gonna see more physics-informed machine learning uh, or physics-informed neural networks or others where the objective might be to minimize the mean squared error, um, but also from the equations of a physics-based model, where we combine these into a unified model and do the fitting simultaneously. So these new architectures are going to emerge to allow us to use the right type of information, whether that comes from data or from equations or a combination of the two. Now, here we have uh, also physics-informed data-driven modeling. Uh, this is an example where we've integrated uh, Gecko to be able to import things like TensorFlow models, Scikit-Learn, and others. Um, also, in the Seek platform for system identification. So working with dynamic models, also with some of these uh, empirically-driven models as well. All right, so let's talk about the future of open source tools in particular, what's needed. 
And one of the, the things that's emerged with the large body of, of software tools is that we need long-term support and maintenance for these. Uh, these tools can quickly become outdated, even though the source is there, the number of people that know how to update uh, or improve that source, uh, we need some support for those individuals. So we need um, stakeholders that are interested in maintaining these to dictate the priorities. So to give that feedback about um, not just, you know, these are the all the development options, but these are the most important ones. Also understanding the development process for the open source tools you rely on. So instead of just download those and use them, uh, to be able to understand uh, what is the development process to improve them. Okay, support and coordination of upstream and downstream dependencies. So as these some of these open source tools become very interconnected, how can you uh, coordinate some of these uh, cross dependencies between these packages. Also, we need additional community involvement to ease that, uh, especially from uh, some of the big users that uh, use these in industrial applications uh, to remove the fear of contributing to these communities and giving back. Um, so, we also need adoption of good software engineering practices. Okay, so lots of good infrastructure for open source. There's repository hosting, automated testing, documentation training, software packaging, and distribution. So if you're thinking about putting one of these packages out there, I recommend that you go maybe on read the docs, put your documentation there, host your code on GitHub, uh, or other packages that uh, track changes and change management to be able to uh, reveal what's happening with the development. All right, also encourage your students, if you're in a faculty, to get involved with open source as well. So maybe as part of projects to be able to contribute uh, something to a package, for example. So Scikit-Learn uh, started as a Google Summer of Code internship project. And so some students actually started that and uh, it's evolved into a great open source package. All right, and then another important thing is that uh, recognition of code and software contributions, especially if you are building into a larger architecture um, to be able to recognize those who have contributed to the dependencies. All right, and then another thing that's needed is interoperability of existing tools. So blending of these data-driven equation-based methods, as I mentioned. So thank you for your attention, uh, and we're glad to take any comments or questions about this. We also have a publication that has resulted from this, and we'll be posting that as well.